So how could an attacker achieve full arbitrary code execution and take over the entire system with this vulnerability? Well, let's watch a demo video. All right, because the Eclipsium researchers didn't uh, provide a voiceover, I'll provide one for them. So they've got a Windows machine that is going to be vulnerable to this particular firmware attack. They're first going to show you that there is no auto-executing program that uh, would run at every single boot doing the attacker's bidding. So they're going to show you that it's running, it's uh, Microsoft Windows 10, they've got secure boot on, and this one, the PCR7 is in a bound state. That refers to the platform configuration registers used on TPMs, which as the name implies, it stores configuration information, specifically a measurement of something at boot time is measured into that register and essentially that value can only change based on you know hashes of measurements and so forth. So this is typically used with Microsoft BitLocker, which I'll highlight shortly. Uh, and the whole idea is that sort of the measurements of your boot components are all kind of locked into a known good measurement set. Uh, and then you shouldn't be able to log into the system if it you know magically changes out behind the scenes on you, because that could suggest there's an attacker there. So they've got virtualization security all turned on. So all of the best available Microsoft security mechanisms. All right, they've also got the firmware protection mechanism on and BitLocker is enabled. So as they mentioned in their attack, there exist mechanisms to effectively suspend BitLocker uh, from within the operating system, which is where you know, your initial attack would potentially be launched from. And so by suspending it, uh, this completely defeats the capability to lock in known good measurements. And then you can just go ahead and you know, infect the BIOS and that will lead to new measurements. So now they're going into the Dell Latitude settings and they're going to tell it to do a over the air firmware update. And so that's gonna kick off the start of this vulnerability. Uh, one of the vulnerabilities they found was in the fact that the firmware would allow speaking to not just a Dell SSL certificate, but any sort of wildcarded SSL certificate. And so ultimately the attacker can feed in data that's going to be misparsed, things like the XML configuration information, which will invoke the vulnerability and allow for attacker controlled code execution. Uh, before it ever even gets a chance to, you know, validate the digital signatures over things like the EFI images that are sent in. So I'm going to go ahead and speed this up. You know, obviously they appropriately didn't, uh, you know, speed things up in their original video to make it unedited, but I'm going to edit it and speed things up. So on we go and they boot up their Windows system. And what do we see? Well, we see the executable.exe in the system currently running when it previously wasn't. And specifically, you can see that it has been set as a automatically starting executable. So they did that from their, you know, infected boot chain just to prove that, you know, they can bootstrap their way into the system when they've successfully taken over the firmware, which is what you would expect architecturally. And all the security mechanisms are still on and still saying everything is safe but the system has been fully and thoroughly compromised at boot time. So the things like, you know, firmware protection, memory integrity, all saying they're enabled still, as is BitLocker. But again, the system has been fully compromised. So how did this work, right? Let's go understand the exploit for this vulnerability. Now, even though this class isn't about exploitation, I do need to explain a little bit about a exploitation technique called return-oriented programming or ROP. So the idea of ROP is that the attacker is subject to certain exploit mitigations that we'll talk about in the mitigation section. And therefore, in order to get around the, those, they will try to execute little snippets of existing code, which are called gadget and they end in a return assembly instruction. So that's why it's called return-oriented programming. Little snippets of code, little gadgets that end in return. So the return assembly instruction removes the value at the top of the stack, and that alters the stack pointer, and it takes that value and it puts it into the instruction pointer. So we're gonna be talking about this in the context of a Intel x86 system where this was actually exploited. So on Intel systems, the register that indicates what code should be executed is called the instruction pointer. 
So basically, the return assembly instruction pulls a value off the top of the stack, sticks it into the instruction pointer register, and that indicates where the next gadget can be found, where it will continue code execution. Now, as I said, ROP is usually an exploit technique that's used to work around exploit mitigations, such as non-executable stack or address-based layout randomization. But in reality, neither of those exploit mitigations are actually in play when they're attacking this Dell BIOS. Instead, they're using ROP to increase the reliability due to the fact that the stack addresses could move around due to exploiting different versions of the code on different models and different build versions of the code. So this is just going to increase reliability the same way it would do with when you're trying to get around exploit mitigations, but here it's just trying to get around some natural little bit of randomization due to different builds. So let's understand the stack situation. So we've got the vulnerable code, we had already looked at that, and when the vulnerable code is done executing, like any sort of function, it is going to end with a return assembly instruction. So the buffer overflow was on that buff on stack, which was at RBP minus 158, so we knew it was sort of, you know, a maximum of 158 bytes before it would start corrupting things like the saved RBP. So when the attacker overflows the stack, they're going to fill in some stuff like this, some padding, some shell code, which is this particular shell code is not the full code that achieves all the attacker's goals. Instead, it's some shell code that's going to find some other full code, and that code will actually have been attached to the EFI executables that they sent in. Because the attacker is achieving code execution before any sort of verification of the EFI executable, it's fine for them to just attach that and it'll never be subject to code signature verification or anything like that. So they put some shell code and then they're going to put the address of the first ROP gadget. We said ROP is just reused code that is going to be uh, found in the existing, in existing code base. So the stack pointer at the time that this is overflowed is going to hold this uh, address of the ROP gadget. So it's going to point at the address of the ROP gadget. The instruction pointer is going to be right about to execute this return, which means the return is going to pop this address off the top of the stack and start executing there. So what that's going to point at is again some reused code found in the existing UEFI code base. And that code is going to have, you know, three assembly instructions. So again, I can't assume you know assembly, so I've just put in the long form here and we'll talk about that in a second. So again, you know, it, uh, it overflows. It's got an address of this code that's already baked in. It's got some register value, register value, and then another ROP gadget. That's some other code that's going to be found inside the UEFI code naturally. And then it's got this thing, which is a call to shell code. So this is going to be some assembly that will call down to here. This will call off to some other code somewhere else. And then there's some things like helper functions here. All right, so let's go ahead and execute this return assembly instruction. So they've successfully smashed the stack. They've put all this stuff on here. They know that this offset is going to be the stack pointer. It's going to point at their next ROP gadget. So what starts happening when they execute this code? Well, they execute that return assembly instruction. It pulls this off the top of the stack, thus moving the stack pointer to point right here. And now the instruction pointer has been pointed wherever this was pointing, which is right here. And so what is the first assembly instruction here? It says, remove the value from the top of the stack and store it into register RSI. So this value that's currently at the top of the stack is going to be placed into the RSI register. So if you do no assembly instruction, this is literally just a pop RSI. All right, so now let's execute that. It once again, you know, it removed something from the top of the stack. So now the stack points here at this value to be put into the RBP register, or sorry, RBX register, and the assembly instruction is going to remove that value from the top of the stack and store it into register RBX. So again, that's just a pop RBX assembly instruction. That causes the stack pointer to now move up to here. And now, again, this is return-oriented programming because it's some little snippets of code that end in return. That return is going to grab this value off of the stack, stick it into the instruction pointer, and then the instruction pointer will now point here. All right, instruction pointer points at some code that says jump to the address held in the stack pointer register. Well, the stack pointer points here at this little snippet of call to shell code. So this is assembly instruction for a call, and that call is going to call down here to this code. 
So instruction is executed. Instruction pointer now points here. It will execute this code, call to shell code. Now, this is the first point where I need to say, you know, if there had been non-executable stack uh, exploit mitigation in play, it would not be possible to execute this call assembly instruction right from here. And that's again why it's important to have these exploit mitigations. But it's not in play, so it, it uh, executes this assembly, which is going to call down to here. And this is now going to be a little bit more assembly. And that's, this assembly is just going to go off and find some other code that has been just tacked on to the EFI executable. And so then that other code is what did all of the things that you saw in the demo video about, you know, taking control of the boot flow, infecting windows, injecting code, and ensuring that that code would always execute every time the system is run. So again, as the researchers indicated, things like UEFI firmware do lag significantly behind operating systems and applications when it comes to employing exploit mitigations. The heap and stack are executable, whereas normally you would expect them to be non-executable in an operating system. There's no stack canaries, so this linear stack overflow just worked, and there's no address-based layout randomization. But like they said here, different systems may load things at different addresses, and that's why they ended up using ROP as opposed to just hard coding a fixed address into their exploit. And all of the code running in the firmware at the system boot is running in what's called Ring Zero on Intel, the most privileged execution environment possible.